Some of the content covered may be graphic in nature. Your discretion is advised. So what we're going to talk about is, uh, this is going to be about, you know, my, I like to talk about cars every once in a while. So we're going to talk about the Ford Pinto. The Ford Pinto um, was a car in the 70s and people that grew up at that time will, you know, know of the Ford Pinto. Uh, it was produced from 1971 to 1980. It's a subcompact car. So today think of like a like a you know, Honda Fit or a Chevy Spark, something like that. It was a small car at the time. Spec. S spec, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like a two-door spec or something. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a small car at the time that was a considered subcompact car. Uh, it was introduced on September 11th, of all days, 1970, to the public. So this was, this was Ford's answer to the uh, AMC Gremlin and the Chevy Vega, which... All these cars are long gone. Hell, AMC is gone. The whole company is gone. So, you know, these were small cars for people that wanted fuel economy, didn't want to drive around a tank like they did in the 70s. All cars were tanks, most of them. So the idea of the car was great. It was a cheap car, you know, got you from A to B. Uh, it was a, it's, I mean, I guess you can say it was a decent looking car if you like those kind of, you know, smaller looking vehicles. But the product development of the vehicle started in 1968, and again, like I said, it came out in 70. Well, early on, um, what had happened was Ford had, no had noticed that there were some issues with the gas tank on this car. The way that the gas tank was positioned, uh, it basically, it's, it's, uh, the Pinto's design positioned its fuel tank between the rear axle and the rear bumper. Now that was a standard practice in the U.S., especially on sub, you know, subcompact cars at the time. Now, if you were to picture that, think of getting into a collision on a very small car with the tank being a gas tank in between an axle and the and the bumper. Okay, a rear end collision. What's going to happen? Obviously, the gas tank is going to rupture. Rupture, right? So Ford knew about this early on. Um, you know, in 1970, crash tests it showed vulnerability, and in '73. Ford started getting field reports of the Pintos being consumed by fire at low end, low rear end uh, speeds. What, like uh, what speed roughly? Like under 30 miles an hour. Oh, wow. You know, under like 25 in these cars were starting to, and they knew this immediately. Again, we got to remember 1970s cars were horrible vehicles. Okay. They were not built well at all. And the Pinto had a transmission issue that would cause the car to stall right out in the middle of the road. The transmission would just would just stop and the car would just die right in the middle of the road. Um, and it contributed to a lot of these rear end collisions as well. So when you're driving down the street and your car just ends up stopping, you know, just stalling, someone's going to run into the back of you. So that had a lot to do with this. Uh, what happened was Ford knew about this defect, but decided it would be cheaper to pay out on lawsuits than recall all the millions of Pintos. Very similar to what the guy in Fight Club goes to investigate as his job. Yep. Yep. So this was denied, and of course this was been in denied by Ford. Even the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, of course, short for NHTSA, Invest, their investigation also finally, year, a couple years later, indicated that the fuel tank design was faulty. Of course, Ford always stuck, uh, stuck with their story saying that there was no evidence that the car was any more dangerous than other cars on the road. The, the way the bumper was designed, okay, you got to understand this bumper wasn't like we have today. It was almost a very, very uh, um, thin piece of metal, okay? It was essentially ornamental rear bumper. And that also, um, you know, hurt a lot of the way that when this car got impacted, the bumper did almost nothing, nothing at all to prevent this. Now, as a result, 27 people were killed in these cars from rear end collisions, these vehicles, or they were severely burned or, or killed. Uh, in 19, to add, to, to make this even worse, 
Finally, Ford, when, when Ford realized, and there's a recall notice a ni- from 1978, and the recall notice, you know, basically read, Ford Pintos have experienced moderate speed rear-end collisions that have resulted in fuel tank damage, fuel leakage, and fire occurrences that have resulted in fatalities and non-fatal burn injuries. That was a recall notice. So one family in Indiana had uh, stopped their Pinto and... Uh, had got out to get something of the fuel cap had basically um, fallen off. They left the fuel cap off the car and they stopped in the middle of the highway to, to, to wait. To, it fell in the roads. They wanted to get their fuel cap off. A Chevy van rear-ended this Pinto with the three teenage girls in it, killing all three of them. The car burst into flames. Now, to make matters worse, Ford sent the recall notice in 1979. Ford sent this family a recall notice after all three of their kids were killed. In the car and another thing uh, this would be the first time too uh, that the a company corporation like Ford was um, you know accused of murder believe it or not they were charged with murder on this and this is the first time ever a company was uh, you know because of the, what happened this was again in going back in 1978 with these Indiana teens um, it was a it was in, it was court case Indiana versus Ford and it was a landmark product liability law as the first time a corporation faced criminal charges for defective product and the first time a corporation, like I just said, was charged with murder. Uh, Ford, you know, and with them sending the, the recall notice after, <laughs> after the fact, uh, Ford was found not guilty. They had obviously high-powered lawyers that were able to get, get, them, out of it. get them out of it. Right. God, uh, but, sucks. but earlier on, Wait, Ford, was there a settlement for the family at least? Yeah, they got like, I think, Ten thousand dollars each for each wow. kid. Yeah, wow. but now early on in the seventies, because before Ford issued out that recall notice, there were people that Ford had to pay out over a hundred million dollars. I think one hundred seventy some million dollars to families because that was before Ford wanted to admit that there was a there was a design issue, a design defect. So they paid a lot of money out in the seventies, but this poor family. Uh, you they know, lost everything. They lost everything, and Ford knew about this. The car was discontinued in 1980, finally, and you know Ford did make changes to the design. They added, um, you know, absorb, you know, better absorbing bumpers, and they did something to try to help, you know, prevent this from happening again. By that time, the sales were already starting to go down, and you know the car was already on its way out. It was replaced by the Ford Escort. But this just goes to show you how you know we look, you know we we look at cars today, and. This was one of the first big recalls that were that caused deaths. You know, a lot of people talk about the Chevy Corvair, but this was your first big. You know, we we look at the GM ignition thing that just happened recently, and the Toyotas with the sticking accelerators. But this was the first time that, and this is when the car companies knew that they would face strict punishment for not handling recalls and taking, you know, and and making defective. Um, you know, parts on cars. So by this point in time, companies knew, you know, after this happened that they had to, they had to shape up, you know, and then things did start shaping up. I mean, quality still wasn't the greatest in the eighties. So, you know, Ford's reputation took a huge, huge hit with this, this Ford Pinto. I mean, it was in the news, it was in the media, it was everywhere, you know, about in Life Magazine did an article on it, a lot of the news, I mean, because they had, it was a big lawsuit and it, it really hurt their reputation. Do you think that this was like really the, you know, the downfall of the American car was like this when it really started. The downfall, yeah, really, you're absolutely right. The downfall did start in the early se- mid '70s because the quality, the unions, uh, they didn't care. I mean, they were half the people were showing up drunk to the factories. You know, the car work, the car factory workers. Uh, they were putting beer cans inside doors. You know, um, are you serious? Yeah, there was a beer can, a couple pop cans and beer cans found inside door panels. There was a story of Ford where a uh, Ford Granada, this uh, the one of the field uh, adjust not adjusters, but one of the field reps for Ford was called to a dealership, and the car, the steering wheel was put into the middle of the dash. They built the car with the steering wheel in the middle of the dash. Don't ask how they did that or why they did that, but the car came off the truck from the factory with a steering wheel, not on the left side, in the middle. How the fuck? But, I mean, like, isn't all that shit molded, though, so that that doesn't happen? Well, you would think. I, I mean, this guy was a Ford, ex- a former Ford executive, and he even said it to this day. He said, I have no idea how, this, how that could have even happened. 
So, you know, but it goes back to the auto industry took a huge hit in the 70s. And this was, I mean, this car, 27 people died from 71 to 77. And that was just in those years. I mean, there were more people that died afterward. But by then, you know, they Ford took most of those cars off the road or fixed them with the, you know, with, with the, the car was named the Fire Trap because it was nicknamed the Fire Trap because of what happened with this vehicle. And, uh, you know, Ford knew, the problem was here is it's understandable to build something and, and you know, and, and there's a defect to it, but you fix it. You know, you fix the defect, and, and Ford would rather just, they were more worried about their profits than lives. And it's documented in plenty of places. I mean, Ford kept, you know, they, they, they said there was nothing, but when the, when, when the you know, when, when you have the government coming after you and saying it, there's probably, and people are dying, you know, the design was faulty from the start. I don't know, man. I think all cars are shit now. <laughs> Not compared to the 70s. No, no. It, <laughs> it's actually crazy because you think about, in the 70s, there was some decent sized cars still. Right. You know, those cars are all, what I, they're very rigid. It was chrome and metal back then. Right. Not plastic but like that's today. That's the thing is everything was metal. Right. You know, I could see this happening now where everything's plastic. But now they, 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 you know, they have these tanks designed, you know, again, you wouldn't design a gas tank between the axle and between the bumper. That's a horrible, horrible design. No, yeah, that's. Or not, if you do it, you at least have extremely bump, uh, strong bumpers that can withstand over 30 miles. And that was the other thing. Ford knew that the bumpers were not up to government code. The government said we need these, they need to be 30 mile per hour bumpers on these cars. And Ford only put a 20 mile per hour bumper on the back of that pinno. See, and that's the fucked up thing. And that's how fucking unions and like workers like this ruin things in America because right. they do. And I'm not saying that a, an auto line worker is an entry level job or a minimum wage job. Right. But when the salaries get to be like Ford probably was put in a corner where that we have to make sure that we're making things and paying all these people these insane wages. So right. that way we can still make cars and still stay a company. Right. And that's how fucked up unions are. Right. Like they're there are good things about unions and there's really fucked up things about unions and like that's one of the things that I think that like causes a lot of problems right. in America and like you know these people that think that they should get $15 an hour to do uh, you know a, a job that doesn't require that right they're gonna work themselves out of a job because you know it doesn't cost that much money to make a hamburger. Right. It doesn't and cost this much money. I mean, how much, and I don't know if you know the figure, but how much does it really cost to make a car? Right. Well, I mean, yeah, and the thing is that they, they figure all that in. The bean counters figure all that stuff in. Well, how much do you think what? a car actually costs to manufacture, like, from the ground up? Well, if, if, I, if I'm if paying $23,000 for a Honda Civic. Probably costs about 10000 to make that car. Yeah. I mean, I'm just throwing a number out. Yeah. I mean, something around that probably costs about ten grand to make it. So the thing is, and, if, and not just to put Ford in the corner, because GM's been, you know, GM got in a lot of trouble just, I mean, the most recent was the ignition crisis, you know, and then Toyota. Which is foreign, you know what I mean? So right. you can't say it, but right. actually half of the, uh, like, Japanese cars are, they have plants here in America anyway, and the American shit's built overseas. Right, and then and most recently, Ford was back in the news in the late 90s with the Explorers, remember? The, the Exploders? The Exploders, the tire, the Firestone tires would, would untread and the thing would, the tire would blow out and the, the, the thing would flip over. You right, know, A lot of right. people died from that. that I remember also, like, the top-heavy cars were, like, you know, the Jeeps were saying that you take us, the, the center of gravity was so high on the car that it would cause the car to tip over while you're the, getting like, on the highway. The trackers. Oh, yeah. 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 Wow, those <laughs> things. Yeah, I remember uh, Sovi used to have one of those. He'd oh, fucking yeah. jump the tracks. So <laughs> <laughs> get some serious air in that thing. Oh, shit. Corporate greed, that's what that's called. Yeah. Well, that's it for this week's episode. If you like what you saw, please like, share, subscribe, and comment below. I'm John Bazinski. From the Mistake on the Lake, this is Type 3 TV. Over and out.